Hello, my name is Craig Stephen Titus, and I'm a professor at Divine Mercy University. I have a great pleasure of moderating this evening's event. To begin with, I would like to introduce Father Charles Sikorsky, the president of Divine Mercy University. He will open our event with a prayer, Father Sikorsky. Thank you, Dr. Titus. And first, just let me welcome everyone to this uh, Newman Lecture this evening. We're looking forward to it. I think it's a really a fascinating topic that Dr. Paul Vitz will be presenting on uh, human consciousness. And uh, for just uh, want to welcome everyone here at Divine Mercy University. We, we like to blend the best of Catholic thought about the human person with the best of science in the field of mental health. We feel it's essential these days to have a Christian presence in this field. And it raises so many interesting questions. And Dr. Vitz, who's been a scholar who's been with us since our very beginning, uh, we're really blessed to have had him so long. And we're very blessed to have him tonight with, with, his, uh, with his talk. And so uh, also I'd like to wish everyone a happy feast of the Immaculate Conception, Mary, our mother. We celebrate uh, her Immaculate Conception as God prepared her to bring Jesus to the world. And a lot of what we like to do uh, in, at, as uh, in the work we do at DMU is to prepare people to receive the Lord. And a lot of you could say, counseling, psychology, spiritual direction. We're helpers, uh, God's helpers. Uh, we try to imitate our Blessed Mother in uh, assisting others and helping others to receive uh, God's presence in their lives, to receive our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we begin this evening, let's, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity this evening to uh, hear this lecture and to have insights about really the mystery of the human person and what is it that makes us human. Help us to learn more about how you've created us, how you've made us, you've made us so wonderfully, so beautifully. Help us as well uh, to prepare in this way for uh, Christmas here in this Advent season. Help us to open our hearts examine our lives to see how we can better serve you. We can prepare our, our hearts, our souls to receive your son this Christmas. We ask for the grace, the strength to do that, to do that as you will. We want to as well pray for all those who are suffering, pray for all those, for the poor, for those who are sick, for those who are ill, those who are dying. And in a special way, we pray for all those who, who are suffering from mental illness, different uh, challenges, maybe in their marriage or family, different emotional issues they may be struggling with. Help our DM community, our, 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 our clinicians, our students, all those who are in contact with so many souls, help us to better bring hope, to better bring healing to them and to their lives. And we pray for each, each one of those who uh, are within our network of, of, uh, of love and of service to you. Uh, special way, let's pray tonight for Dr. Vitz and his family that he uh, tonight enlighten us uh, and, 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 and so that we can better cooperate with your will uh, and with your mission and better become who you made us to be. And we ask all these things in the name of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Father Charles, for those inspiring words. And that prayer that leads us uh, closer to our Lord and our Lady um, in this fine, this fine evening, this fine afternoon. Following the Newman Lecture today, there'll be a question and answer period. I know lots of people will love to ask questions, questions that spring from the lecture, questions that spring from their encounter with what uh, Dr. Paul Witz will be saying. Please feel free to write um, the questions in either the chat box or the Q&A box at the bottom of your panel. And there'll be, a, after the lecture, a short break as uh, Povitz prepares himself to respond to your questions. So good. So next, um, I'm happy to introduce the Newman series itself. The series is held under the sponsorship um, of Divine Mercy University. It is in its 23rd year. 
and it survived many challenges and I trust it will again with our Lord's protection and our Lady's guidance. In particular, um, the 2022-2023 Newman Lecture Series celebrates the, the integration of a Catholic Christian vision of the person with mental health sciences through the life work of DMU's most influential scholar, Paul C. Witz. His life has been that of tireless service through his teaching, mentoring, lecturing, and writing at DMU, where he served as, where he is serving as a senior scholar. He is also Professor Emeritus of Psychology at uh, New York University, where he taught for many years prior to joining the IPS at the DMU. Paul Witz is one of the founding fathers of the Institute for the Psychological Sciences and of its becoming Divine Mercy University. He has assured the intellectual foundation of the university while also contributing to its public visibility, which also benefit, benefited the growth of Divine Mercy University. Dr. Witz is an internationally recognized psychologist who has devoted his life to an integrated approach to psychology and the human person and family from a Catholic perspective. He has made an impact on contemporary psychology for over 40 years, starting before the publication of his groundbreaking book, Psychology as Religion, The Cult of Self-Worship. His work is a sobering call to psychology to recognize its own limits and its needs to make a place in psychology for transcendence and truth instead of reductionism and relativism. With his congenial attitude and friendly nature, he has also been instrumental in focusing his energy and that of others on the creation and refining of a unique meta model. This model is expressed in a volume of which he is co-editor and contributor. The book has um, been given two awards. First, the Expanded Reason Award of 2020 for research from the, Vac from the Vatican Foundation, Joseph Ratzinger and Benedict XVI, and the University Francisco de Vitoria, Madrid, Spain. And the second is the Catholic Media Award, 2020 as well, with honorable mention in faith and science from the Catholic Media Association. Dr. Witz is a prolific writer and a much sought after speaker. His uh, contributions to the field are extensive and expansive. To comment more on his, um, on, to comment further on his more than lengthy curriculum V-Day would take all the time that we have at our disposal. And I did tell Paul that I wouldn't go over five minutes. So fortunately, the only thing better than hearing more about Paul Witz is to hear from Paul Witz himself. So let's proceed, Dr. Witz. Thank you, Craig. Wow, that's something to live up to. Well, anyway, greetings everyone. Greetings to all of you, not just here in front of me, but many of you are on Zoom all over the place. Uh, some of you are students. Some of you have told me that you are interested in my work from some other perspective or for some other location. So greetings from Northern Virginia and welcome to this evening. In presenting my ideas this evening, I will be doing a fair amount of reading from a paper that I wrote and published some years ago. The paper is titled, The Origin of Consciousness in the Integration of Right Hemisphere and Left Hemisphere uh, Capacities. And you can find it, uh, if you start looking for my name and that title, uh, it uh, was published in 2017. But I will read from it fairly often, stopping to talk about and discuss or emphasize certain points. So we begin. I will start with presenting a once familiar, but now rather forgotten figure and scene from the life of Helen Keller. Remember Helen? She was blind, deaf, and mute, and as a child was taught language by using words communicated to her by her teacher by touch on her hand. Others may have heard or read about the scene 
in which some of her most in interesting experiences occurred, but others have not heard her or read these, these descriptions. So I will read in some detail how she does about her life, about her situation, and then from her own words. Helen was born a normal, healthy child in 1880 in a small town in Alabama. However, at age 19 months, she had a serious fever for a few days. And after recovering, her parents discovered that Helen was blind, deaf, and mute. A little over five years later, her teacher, Annie Sullivan, came down from Boston where she'd been trained to teach the blind and the deaf. But someone as, as harmed, as you will, as Helen, she had not been trained to teach. This was the first time anyone had met a blind and deaf, much less also mute person. At least it was the first time somebody who had been trained there in Boston had done that. I don't know what has happened with this kind of a situation since. At the time, Helen would often have temper tantrums. She's now about six something years old. I would have, have temper tantrums. She had no eating manners. and was in many respects wild and uncontrollable. She had no serious communication with anyone, even her parents. She was essentially an intelligent, but wild, high level, non-human primate. More later, her teacher took her to live in a small cottage behind the family's main house. Here, Annie physically forced, Annie, her teacher, physically forced Helen to learn to eat with a spoon and fork, to wear clothes correctly, and in other ways, she developed a relationship, a very tough love with Helen. She had to first make clear that her authority had to be dealt with and that you had to pay attention to her because prior to that, she hadn't learned to pay attention to anyone, including her parents. After a short time, Helen quieted down and the two became deep, lifelong friends. Soon Annie began to teach words to Helen. She did this by pairing patterns of touch, patterns of touch from her hand, Helen's hand, which was her, Helen's right hand onto the right hand I mean, uh, it was uh, Annie's right hand onto the right hand of Helen, okay? For example, when given an object, she could reliably uh, give her teacher the correct code pack. But here's how it would go. Helen would put her left hand on an object. Let's say it was a pen. Annie, her teacher would tap a kind of pattern of tactile cues on her right hand, on Helen's right hand. Annie would do this with her right hand on Helen's right hand. It's very important, these hands. The left hand therefore was always contacting an object, an experience, something, some sensory perceptual reality. And the right hand was always given a code that had nothing to do with it, except it was an arbitrary association, which was in quotes, the name of it. Now, after a good number of months, Annie had developed a vocabulary of almost a thousand words in which if the code was put on her right hand, she could correctly pick what object was referred to out of a set of possible objects. So she had developed what I call paired associative learning. She didn't know the names, but she could pair a particular experience on her right hand with a particular experience in her left hand. This is rather like an animal, a dog can learn their name. It's a paired associate learning. But one day, something very important happened. One day, Annie took, was it later in the morning around 11 or 12, took her took Helen down to a pump, a water pump. 
you know, that kind of thing. And Helen put her hand under the pump and the water came out on her hand. And while she, the water was coming out on her hand, that cool liquid touch movement of the water, Annie put the word that is the code, the tactile code on, on Helen's right hand for the word water. And this was after a long time of having a lot of these associations going on. But here's what Annie said in her own words. We walked down the path to the well house. Someone was drawing water and my teacher placed my hand under the spout. As the cool stream gushed over one hand, she spelled into the other the word water. First slowly, then rapidly. I stood still, my whole attention fixed upon the motion of her fingers. Suddenly I felt a misty, a misty consciousness in something, somehow the mystery of language was, was revealed to me. I knew then that W-A-T-E-R on my right hand meant the wonderful cool sounding thing that was flowing over my left hand. She doesn't mention the hand, which hand it was here. I had to find out. That living word awakened my soul, gave it light, hope, joy, set it free. Something qualitatively enormously different occurred. Prior to that, she had proto names, word associations. But now suddenly she transcended the two kinds of information she had. One was right hemisphere information that was, you know, that was coming in her left hand. That was the object, the water, the water, the, the sensory perceptual experience. And then her other hand, which was in going to her left hemisphere, was the code. And suddenly she transcended those two experiences and knew she was the namer. She knew that everything had a name and that she could find out its name. That was what happened. I left the well house eager to learn. This is Annie, I mean, this is Helen saying, everything had a name and each name gave birth to a new thought. As we returned to the house, every object which I touched seemed to quiver with life. That was because I saw everything with a strange new sight that had come to me. On entering the door, I remembered even the doll I had broken. I had felt my way to the hearth to the hearth and picked up the pieces. I tried vainly to put them together again. Now the doll, the doll had been broken before her insight, before she'd gone to the well house. I vainly tried to put the pieces together. Then my eyes filled with tears for I realized what I had done. And for the first time, I felt repentance and sorrow. A totally new experience has occurred because of her transcending the two kinds of codes and knowing now the, mean, the basic insight of language, which is naming, and then language grows further from that. But one of the first experiences she had was a qualitatively new one, and it was remorse or guilt for what she had done. I learned a great many new words that day. I do know that mother, father, Sister, teacher were among them. Words, were, words that were to make the world blossom for me. It would have been difficult to find a happier child than I was as I lay in my crib in the, in the close of, at the close of that eventful day and lived over the joys it had brought me. And for the first time, long for a new day to come. She's also learning time. She learned, she learned from the first time there's a tomorrow. There was a yesterday. Later, Helen wrote that, it, that, the, that in the prior years, prior to this insight, quote, she had no concepts whatsoever of nature or mind or of death or of God. I literally thought with my body Without a single exception, my memories of that time are tactile. 
as she goes on. I know I was impelled like an animal to seek food and warmth. I remember crying, but not the grief that caused the tears. I kicked and because I recall physically, I know that I was angry. I imitated those about me when I made signs for things I wanted to eat. But there's not one spark of emotion or rational thought in these distinct yet bodily memories. So there was a different total kind of existence prior to it. That prior kind of existence I am going to call just being aware. It's a kind of animal existence. I call it awareness, I call it qualia one. And it's what she transcended when she came into human consciousness by discovering language first by discovering naming and as later language would develop even further for her from that. I term this basic animal like awareness or also qualia one. It's presumed that it is qualitatively different from the physical stimulus itself and the sensory neurological response which underlies it. It's an actual kind of very, very primitive uh, awareness, but it is different, I think, qualitatively from the, the physical things that cause it and the neuro neurological experience underneath it. So I call it qualia one, but animal-like experience. Helen turned out to be both intelligent and sensitive, indeed a remarkable woman. She graduated from Radcliffe College at Harvard, wrote several books and became an important and positive public figure. However, our concern is with the meaning of her sudden qualitative change in consciousness from qualia one to what I call qualia two, human consciousness, centered in the language insight and developed from that. Her sensory experience was of water, which is of course an analog code. It's a code that's experienced in the right hemisphere on one hand and in the other tactile, the digital pattern or code for water. That is her right hand experienced the tactile code, but the tactile code has nothing physically like water to it. It's like a word that has no physical similarity to what it references. So that physical code on her right hand was a, a digital code, had no similarity to its referent. Suddenly she transcended the two separate but associated experiences and knew that water was the name of the sensory experience. This insight is not just a simple linking of a digital code with a sensory experience. She'd already done that with paired associate learning. Instead, she suddenly had a grand number of new words that she would ask for. She asked for you know, the name of her mother, her father, her teacher's name and so forth. She transcended both the codes of water and the strong analog uh, and uh, which had temperature and tactile movement and the right hand handed tactile pattern, which was in the left hemisphere and which was digital. Is that clear? That's what brought her to qualia to human consciousness. It also created these experiences, which we'll go into more later. Perhaps another way of call, describing it is the sudden awareness of symbolic thought. The terms integration and mapping from one code to the other are also equivalent. However, for the insight resulting in integration or mapping to occur, she had to transcend the two codes of right and left hemisphere to a mental level above them. In short, transcendence and integration or mapping presumably happened at the same time and can be summarized as the language or naming insight. It represents the new experience in first occurrence of what qualia two in the life of, of Helen. Qualia two is presumed to be non-material. And that means the experience you're having right now, which is qualia two, as you're listening to me and watching me, that experience of human experience based on language, which is where you've transcended the simpler basic awareness, I assume that's non-material. 
even though it may have some material basis, that doesn't mean that it is just what it may be related to in the brain. It can be a non-material experience interacting with the brain. We'll get to that later. I had to check on the photographs. There were photographs of Annie Sullivan communicating with Helen Keller. And they always showed her with her teacher's right hand on Helen's right hand. And that meant that that's where the tactile code was always going from right hand to right hand, from left hemisphere of Helen, so to speak, I mean of, uh, of Annie, to left hemisphere of Helen. And the objects were always coming in through the, through the left hand, which was going to the right hemisphere. So it's the integration of the two hemispheres and transcending above the experience of each. That is at the insight that creates language and creates the first thing that it creates is the naming insight. And then later other aspects of language occur. Now, what were those later other aspects? Here are some of the things that didn't occur to her. She mentioned that death didn't occur to her until that after that insight. Now this means that the way we can understand death is that animals don't know there is death. And that human beings don't know there is death until they have language. Now Helen didn't know it was what was death until she was about six years old when this insight occurred. That means a newborn infant doesn't know there's such a thing as death. Newborn infants don't have language yet. I'm assuming newborn infants have a life of qualia one. They focus on certain stimuli like the sounds of the mother's voice or her face and her eyes. But it takes time for language to develop in the, in the infant. And, and only when the language insight has been integrated into the life of the infant does the infant know the meaning of things like right and wrong and morality and so forth. We'll talk more about this shortly. But that means that when death came into the world, as scripture tells us, it doesn't mean that animals didn't die before that. It means nobody knew the concept of death. Nobody knew that there was death. No mind, no existing animal knows there's death. And that means even a, a newborn baby doesn't know there's death because I'm assuming the newborn baby is starting out in qualia one before language has come to them yet. That does not mean they're not human, but it means they do not have human consciousness yet. And I think most people would agree that the newborn baby doesn't, and they can't talk. <laughs> they, can look, they can look and pay close attention and they've developed language rather naturally but only by paying a lot of attention to the mother. All right, I'm gonna summarize now the evidence for the qualitative change in consciousness, in consciousness mentioned by Helen. One, there's the clear description of sudden illumination of light coming in as a pre previous, very limited and dull kind of awareness. Something new, she calls it light. I don't know what that would mean to her because she was blind. But some new kind of inner illumination took place, understanding. Two, she goes about learning lots of new names, especially of the people close by to her. Each new name gave her the delight of knowing something new and important. No doubt she also learned, learned shortly thereafter that she could name things herself. Since she is engaged in conversation with her teacher, she has the ability to infer what another person is thinking. She asked questions of the, you know, what is the name of? Look, look what's involved in that. She's asking her teacher, what is the name of this? What is the name of that? 
that tendency to be to, to talk to another person with an inference about another object doesn't develop in any of the great primates, only in humans, and it develops before language at about year one and a half. The idea that you can have something that you have in, you, that you attend to something in common. It starts as the infant noticing the mother and child look at something in common. And that, that they have a, a, a common link, that there's something they're both looking at and they intend to be focused on. And that ability doesn't apparently occur in primates, except the human. And of course, that was immediately present once Helen starts asking her, her teacher, what's the name of this? What's the name of that? You know, what's the name of this? Gives it to her. Oh, that's a cup. Or she can ask for the name of somebody she can imagine, like her mother or father. She discovers before she discovers that a doll that she had spoken, broken earlier. And for the first time she feels remorse, a guilty responsibility and sadness for what she has done. The moral life has now dawned on her, but only through language, after language has developed, I suppose, a certain level. And also, as I said, five, she knows now that there is death. She claims in addition that just after the experience, for the first time, she knew that there was a past, a present, and a future. She had understood now the, the human na nature of time. So all of those point to a qualitatively new reality that has come into existence through the language insight that she hadn't had before when she was operating like a very smart primate. So that's qualia one going to qualia two. One of the reasons consciousness is so important as a topic now is there are, is that lots of people are trying to understand consciousness. And scientists think that they can make a model of consciousness and, and create a machine that has human consciousness. I don't think that's possible for three reasons. One, human consciousness occurs in our body and our body is a wet lab. All the attempts to make consciousness occur outside in a non-human situation have tried to create it in a Silicon Valley type of system that's a machine, which is silicon. Nothing, in other words, where water is in fact of the system of pores water. Consciousness has only emerged in a watery, wet lab situation. Awareness, if it that qualia one even only has emerged there as far as I'm concerned. But we've had it, our mind and everything about our consciousness is, is rooted in watery substances. We are wet lab creatures. And all of these people trying to make consciousness are doing it in a very, very dry lab with silicon, which is hardly found in the humans. Second, or the second reason why I don't think they're gonna be able to do it. Whenever we have consciousness of something, I'm conscious of you out there. You're conscious of me here. You, when you become conscious of something like a, like a mathematical proof or like a system that's logically connected, all right? You are itself outside of that system. Your consciousness is outside of what it is conscious of. So how can you make something that con has consciousness when you are, out, you are always with your consciousness outside of the system in which you're trying to deal with, trying to develop consciousness. What you have is always outside of the system that you're conscious of. So every time they make a new computer program that's fancier in terms of solving chess problems, they're all outside of that program. 
our consciousness seems therefore to be a, a, a non-material experience outside of whatever it is conscious of. And a third reason, I'll get to that later, but now I'll mention it. We are not only, do I say, not only is our own consciousness non-material and therefore intrinsically of a spiritual kind, but we are conscious of something higher than our own consciousness. Today, we celebrate a woman who had that experience, Our Lady. Whatever the message of an angel was, it was to her a message from outside of this world. And she was aware of that. She knew it was from God. That it was. And we have all, many human beings have an awareness of a, of, of an, of a world that transcends our natural consciousness. How do we have this experience? I will mention it to you. Some of you have this experience as in, in a truly mystical experience. Some of you may have had it in a near-death experience. Some of you may just intuit it when you experience great beauty or great, great goodness in something or great truth in something. These are the transcendent uh, concepts that we're all familiar with. And we sense when we come in contact with it, a really surprisingly deep form of truth or goodness or beauty, we sense that it points to something beyond it. And one sign of this is the people who have these experiences usually can't tell you what they're like. They say once they start using our words, our analog and digital words, our right and left hemisphere words that we use in our ordinary qualia to conscious experience, they say you can't mention, you know, it's, it's a qualitatively different level. So we're aware not only of our normal consciousness, often we're not aware that that's qualitatively different from the world around us, but that's our own failure to notice carefully. But we're also aware, we are, most people are aware of something that trans our selves consciousness, of a higher form of consciousness than we've ever actually lived in except briefly when we were there with a near-death experience, deeply in, in a mystical experience or in a deep, profound experience of truth, goodness, or beauty. And so that's another reason I can't imagine uh, an, uh, anything that creates consciousness is going to create an awareness of a still higher level of consciousness itself. Those are my there were three reasons why I think the attempt to make a material that is a physically material form of the human mind that will have consciousness will not be possible. They also all argue for a non-material aspect to the human mind, something that is not to be accounted for in any way by matter. And by the way, we don't know what matter is. Ask a physicist. We don't even know what it really is. They're still squabbling over, you know, have they found the smallest things of the quantum elements, the smallest ones? Or is it known that recently they were looking at, I think, what were they looking at? Protons or something like that and discovered they had a complicated inside. I mean, they thought they were very simple. Uh, They used to think that, you know, every, so it does it get more and more complicated and it goes further. There are sub protons, sub sub proton. I don't know. Does it go on forever or is there some point at which it stops and they're trying to make sense out of it and they can't even now make sense out of what they do know? And it all seems to be mostly space anyway. So, although the materialists say it's all material. They don't, the scientists who are most familiar with matter don't know what it is. And are now even just thinking of talking about matter as having to do with who observes it or how it's observed. Wooga wooga.
So that's, it's more easily understood, I think, to think of consciousness itself as a fundamental property of reality, like matter. And it's not a reductionist understanding. Oh. Okay, now I'm gonna make a, a big jump. How, you know, I'm gonna go, we're not gonna be talking about Adam and Eve. Why are we doing that? Well. The historical record now of, of, of human primates makes it clear that there's no evidence that human consciousness existed before about 30 to 40,000 years ago. Around that time, 30 to 40,000 years ago, there was something they called the creative explosion in which all of a sudden they discovered that human beings, that is primates, we're making design, first marks and patterns and then diagrams of animals and human beings on caves. It took 15,000 years for the human representations of marks to go to a recognizable animal or human form. Just like children when they first learn, you know, they start with straight lines and scribbles and eventually they go to making stick figures and so forth. But anyway, prior to that, although there were lots of caves around, a million years ago, there were lots of caves. There were lots of funny primates around a million years ago. None of them marked on those caves. 500,000 years ago, same thing. 100,000 years ago, they have not found any cave drawings that go back 100,000 years. And if they do, they might find a few scratches here and there, which would be the most primitive. So what I'm proposing is that the first human being who had human consciousness came into existence about 30,000 years, 40,000 years ago. These human beings seem to have come out of North Central Africa, spread rapidly to other parts of the world from there. That doesn't mean the first human being was then. It means the first human consciousness was then, right? I would assume that roughly, let's say, let's say 40 to 30,000 BC, the creative explosion occurs. By 20,000 BC, you get villages, okay? And probably you get by 20,000 BC, the starting of farming and uh, herding. By 12,000 BC, you get maybe the first cities. Okay. That's the historical record. Now let's go to child psychology. When the child is born, I think it's about like he was an 80,000 year old primate. <laughs> he's got no language. But unlike the 80,000 year old primate, he's got somebody, who, he's got a mother who knows language and can start teaching him. And the infant learns language first, they, they learn paired associate learning. Eventually they may learn their name by association or the name of a dog. Even dogs can learn paired associate learning. They know their name sometimes. But then after about, about, a, about an age year, maybe a little earlier, a little later, they learn to focus on something in common. The common intention occurs, and that has to occur before you can go to the naming insight. And then when do they first learn to name things? Maybe two years old. You know, we, we don't have to say exact every child at two. You know, it's a, it's a two plus or minus some months and so forth. 
that start language, language then be, the, the basic language insight has occurred. It then develops further and further and further until finally at an age maybe four or five, let's say five, maybe six, I don't know, around five or six, the moral life becomes plausible. The church is quite wise not to accuse a four-year-old of a sin. They have language. They can name things, but they're not morally developed yet, okay? It takes a while. Language has to mature and grow in many ways. All right, that's child psychology. Now I want to go to another sequence. This is scriptural, all in Genesis. First, in, ch in, chapter, in chapter one, God creates the man, the human beings, male and female from dust. That's the first description. We're created male and female. There's no reference further than that. So that would be when, that's 80,000 years ago. Okay, now, then we come to chapter two in, in, in scripture. So we're later in time. The first thing that Adam does now, he's given a name, although the name may be come from the Hebrew word for dirt or dust. The first thing he does is he names things. So the first, so by then we have an Adam who's maybe, uh, you know, we're we're now not eighty thousand years ago. We're at the creative insight. Could have been thirty thousand years ago when the first Adam started to name things. Could have been an Adam. Could have been an Eve. It could have been the name of a small group or of a couple. We don't know. But at that time. The naming insight was the first thing. And so what Adam did, he named things. But of course, he didn't have anyone to keep him company. That didn't mean there weren't female primates around that were implicitly human. But until his language developed, he couldn't understand that she was bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. So it was after the naming part, slightly afterwards, that he could understand that. And of course, there's the real Adam and Eve that's most discussed in scripture. It's not the Adam that might have been created 80,000 years ago. And it's after Adam has already begun naming so it's the Adam that's maybe equivalent to the five-year-old. The moral life comes, right? The moral life is described after the naming insight. So the sequence is the same as would make sense from our previous uh, rational, both historical and child psychological model. And what happens at the, the Adam and Eve well, it, it, we know the story of being tempted by Eve, being tempted by the snake or the Satan. So we assume the snake is a symbol of, of evil or of Satan. And then Adam eats it, and they then know they're naked, and they had the moral life has come onto them. And at this time, wh where are we in history? Well, when we know we're already up to when we're past, we're at least highly developed village life. Why? Because herding and farming had already developed because the first children of Adam and Eve were Cain and Abel. And Abel was, uh, what was he? He was a farmer, I think. And Cain was a herder. And of course the moral life comes right away with Cain killing, you know, you shall not kill. Cain kills Abel and he's, He's banned, but he has to be marked because the other people will kill him. So the sequence is about, is, there, are no, there are no dates on the sequence, but they come in the same order that you would expect. 
from the ordering in uh, historical time that we do have and the knowledge we do have of how these things develop in a child. So, and then of course, after you can go much further after after Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve in the, at the time of when they were learning the moral life. And that's of course what the whole insight was, wasn't it? When you eat of the tree of good and evil, you, you know what is, that's what you're learning, the moral life. You're learning what's right and wrong. You shall be as God when you do that. And that's what happens then. And so it's not only when they become, shall we say morally, in other words, human life, that we have a record of exists before in a more primitive form that would not necessarily imply what the scriptures say. You might say, well, well we should have had the moral light from the time of the, of the first insight, the first language insight of say 30,000 years ago. No, because we know when that first insight occurred, there was no farming and there was no um, herding. It was still too primitive. So all of this then is beginning to fit as a general model of the origin of human consciousness as a truly non-material phenomenon. And then as it goes on, and, and even at the time of the, of the Adam and Eve and the moral insight there, there's the in interaction with the, the qualia three with God, with, a, with something beyond actually human consciousness. And from then on, you have this series of interactions between human consciousness, qualia, qualia two, and qualia three, which is called revelation. You have this Jonah, Abraham. Obviously, Abraham left a big city, so you know. So the cities were there. So that's maybe, when was Abraham? I don't know, 5,000 BC, 4,000, something like that, I don't know. Moses. 3000 BC, I don't know, 1500, I think Moses around 1500 BC. But each one of these can now be thought of as on a timeline of increasing interaction between qualia three, uh, God as a form of, uh, uh, you know, as a form of divine insight given to the human beings, each of them developing the human being further. And it starts with 80,000 BC, when we were the biologically capable of becoming a human being, like an infant who is, but isn't going to be having it because they don't, they're not yet up to language. And I expect it lasted 40,000 years or so before they developed the first language. And a number of scholars have already said that the proto-language was paired associate learning. That some of them thought that was the same as naming, but it's not. But you would link. You might start off even by mimicry. You hear an elephant. Aah! So you go, Aah! and that becomes the name. And eventually you just, it de degenerates into, and finally you get tired of screeching and you go, Aah. finally you just say L, something like that. And so that becomes an arbitrary sound by that time. But those are associated and you can see how helpful, how helpful that would be for hunters gatherers to be able to refer to things and but of course when the naming insight happened about 30,000 years ago 40,000 years ago there was a huge extinction of other primates like neanderthal man because it was so homo sapiens that got the naming insight who was the first human so there <laughs> Das is all us. That's what I'm trying to connect up with that Ellen Kelly. Oh, I forgot to mention something else. There was another young woman named Laura Bridgman, who was also, because of a fever, blind, deaf, dumb, and she'd even lost most smell and taste. But she had uh, tactile sensation, keeping in touch. That's the most primitive and basic way, keeping in touch. Um, 
And she was taught also by, by teachers at the Boston School who were taught, who was just starting at that time to develop ways to teach the blind and the deaf. And she was taught by two teachers up there in the same way, on the same, I think the same two hands. I couldn't find the hand difference there. I mean, there was no reference to left and right hand. But she was taught a code of tactile code and given objects. It took much longer apparently with her, maybe for whatever reason, but suddenly there came a time when all of a sudden she, she, she asked for a lot of names of all kinds of, of objects, a huge jump in, in vocabulary in a spurt of about a month that was more than all the previous months of, of training. And she also said that she had no notion of God or of death or of time prior to that. And then her name was Laura Bridgman. All the references are in that article that I mentioned. So if you want to get them and look them up. Questions? Oh my gosh. All right, Father Shu. How does that change from How? non-consciousness to consciousness? historically come about? Like, is there some explanation of that? I, mean, I assume that, the, that, that there was a discrete change once you transcended the two codes and realized you could map between each of them and that meant naming and all sorts of other things about the beginning of language. That was the, the discrete moment at which there was a discrete new experience in, in the world of human consciousness. There are plenty of examples in history of relatively discrete changes in qualities, qualities of, of evolution. They're not at once, but you know, there may be suddenly in 10,000 years things. But I'm saying this is a discrete change. And there are plenty of biological things that are discrete. When a sperm and egg cell come together and there's fertilization, that's a discrete sudden event in which a new DNA is created. There's also supposed to be a flash, a little tiny flash of light when that happens. Amazing. But this is a sudden and qualitative change, just like if suddenly you might, if you were praying and then had a mystical experience. Suddenly something new is there and you're speechless now. Other questions? Tom. If our uh, language and learning is dependent on sensory input, how do we arrive at abstract concepts like infinity, eternity, that aren't necessarily related to any kind of sensory input? Well, they begin, they begin with the sensory input, but then they go into what's called, they go to, into the left hemisphere. And in the left hemisphere, they are itself abstract concepts. The left hemisphere, like the, you know, let's say the social security number or even your name, there's no relationship between Tom and you. I mean, the sound, I mean, Tom doesn't look like, you know, there's, no, there's nothing about the sound of your name, your first name that has a physical connection at all with you. So you have there a code that with, has no physical reality. And that, and language has a series of ways of relating things to each other that allows the concept of infinity and non-physical things to take, non-physical linguistic concepts to occur. Does that answer it well enough, I hope? Sister. I think what it means is we've got to recapture, it wasn't uncommon say 500 years ago, but we've got to recapture the idea of looking at a person as containing the spiritual reality of their consciousness and actually of the soul. 
In other words, that the person you're looking at is not entirely a physical thing. That's the way doctors look at us. I'm not gonna argue for the soul itself here explicitly. I'll do that later in the next lecture. But I'm arguing here for three forms of consciousness, qualia one, awareness, which is animal experience, qualia two, which is our human consciousness, which I've described how it comes into existence or what, what, what happens when it comes into existence. And three, qualia, you know, qualia three, the, 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 trend, that would, the experience of something transcending our actual normal qualia two experience. And so we have to see the person as having those potentials. And above all, qualia three is what we're, when in our model, in the meta model, we talk about the vocation to human development. And at least for those who are believers, that vocation in, implies movement from qualia two to qualia three. Movement toward, toward the, the realm in which the transcendent God exists. That's what's said when the, our, the Lord's Prayer said, our father who who art in heaven there's the statement who are in heaven you know that doesn't mean up there somewhere you know between here and the moon or something no it means who are above us in a transcendent sense who exist beyond us above us and we are called to go to that toward that in the spiritual life so we have to and that even everyone else is called in some way to that but we have to be very careful. We're not there to bring them into Christianity or Catholicism or anything like that. They have to find, they have to have free will in their choices. They have to choose freely what they want. But we have to see this person as more realistically as having a property, a non-material property of the transcendent experience of human consciousness, plus the experience that there is even a consciousness above it. It makes everybody kind of weirdly important, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. So I was wondering for humanity, humanity is kind of like that child historically. What event, events or experiences help facilitate? What facilitated the movement to, from one to two in their natural experience? My argument is two things. Uh, one, I, I mentioned it but probably too briefly. There's evidence, there are anthropologists who've argued that there's evidence of prior to language, the development of signaling of a kind that would be interpreted as I would call, I call it paired associate learning. It's the kind of learning that uh, Helen Keller had prior to her insight that was prepping her. You know, it was proto, like proto names, proto language. A dog may learn a few names like his, you know, like his own and maybe yours or a few other things. But Helen had learned apparently almost a thousand names so that if they put a cup in her hand, she could then do the signal on the right hand of, of uh, Annie Sullivan, her teacher. But she was still behaving, you know, in that animal-like way. She was getting to be much more controllable and much more, you know, less wild because she was, she found the interaction with her teacher somehow or other gratifying and, and interesting and so forth. But um, so that would be one of them that would prep you. And, and you'd find that with the child as well. Mama, Papa, learning lots of different associations until finally they got it, hey, yeah. And the other one was the, 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 the mutual, in, having, finding a mutual intent, uh, uh, attention with, the, with another person that is 
the mother and child could point to an object that they were both attending to and were interested in that. And that human primates can do and children do it before they've learned language. And of course, it's necessary for the mother. She wants to say, that's a cup, you know. Well, the child has to learn to focus on what the mother and the child are both supposed to be focusing on. And that relationship, which apparently doesn't occur with other primates, does occur prior to the full language insight around a year old, year and a half or something like that with children. So it's the mutual intention that they have on something, plus the pairing of things that will quick kick in, particularly since the mother has a language, which, you know, is so unfound, you know, no, that, that it took thousands of years for that to develop enough naturally for some, I mean, the other interpretation is that God came down and did it. Had yeah, one or a pair or who knows, because language often involves a pair. For, for all you know, it was a mother and a son or, you know, you don't, you don't know. We don't know. But once it happened, there was a creative explosion. All the rest of the human beings who didn't have it got it quickly and it spread rapidly and they became very efficient hunters and lots of large game animals became extinct along with Neanderthal man and other high level primates. We were very much more effective at killing. Oh, here are questions. Oh, do you think the creative explosion is around the time that humans first had rational souls? Perhaps it was the moment we transitioned from apes to humans. If not, how many thousand years ago did man get a soul? Here's my answer. I'll give more in my next lecture, but I assume that a child who's born and has no human consciousness yet does have a soul at birth. So I assume the first human beings had souls, but they had not yet become capable of being expressed rationally with language yet. Oh yeah. This is the same one, the same question. Does that mean that if Helen Keller died before age six, she would not have had an eternal life that is not have had a soul? If so, does that same logic apply to all children before they experience qualia too? Well, remember, I think the soul, we call it a rational soul, but that's what it is when it's developed with language. The soul can exist in a non-rational way prior to that until the re it helps facilitate the development of reason in the human being. A newborn baby does not have reason, but when the soul is fully expressed, it is rational, but it starts out as a spiritual, I call it a spiritual code, but I'll talk about more of that in my next lecture, what I think the soul is. But I think it's there from the beginning of the human being when the child is born, there's a soul for that child. Uh, and what happened to those human beings prior to their language insight? I don't know, it's sort of like limbo, right? Isn't that what the church talks about? Infants that die and things like that, they don't know quite what happens to them. But I think they had a soul. I think you're born with, when you're at conception, your soul is present.
Is there a difference between consciousness and self-awareness and awareness of awareness? Uh, consciousness is the largest, is the term for the largest quality of our qualia two. It could be called awareness of awareness, but it's, since it's so different from awareness itself, I wouldn't like to use the word awareness of awareness, but it is, consciousness does involve our being aware that there is awareness. Each of you has probably experienced sometime or other awareness without having consciousness in it. I, I, I'm a, besides the fact when you were a newborn infant, but you don't remember that. I don't think you do. But I'll give you an example. This was a report. Um, well, some people have had, the, here are two experiences that people have reported that I believe are like suddenly regressing to just awareness, animal-like. One was a person was in an automobile in the front seat next to the driver, and suddenly the car was out of control and spinning. And the person said, I saw everything in front of me while it was happening. I wasn't frightened or scared or anything. I just saw it. I didn't know its meaning. I just saw things spinning and going around. It's as though under great stress, you might regress to just awareness. And get, let me give you another example that I wish I had marked and none could get as a reference. A man had been, he had been in Africa with a group that was going through a lion country. And he got separated from the group. And while he was separated from the group, he was attacked by a small group of lions. And, but the group could, suddenly saw him. He screamed and ran around and yelled and everything. And so they came over and uh, he, he, he escaped from the lions back with the group. Okay? And they said, weren't you terrified? We were. <laughs> the people who were watching were still in normal consciousness. But he said, no, I was aware that they were there and I was running from them and I knew I was shrieking and saying these things, but I did, it didn't have any real meaning or emotion with it. Where did you hear language like that that I mentioned tonight? Helen Keller, before she had the insight. And one of the things that this makes me think, which is, it's a nice thing to think. Most huge numbers of animals live by eating other animals. It would be nice to know that when a, a, a lion jumps on a gazelle and the gazelle shrieks and runs around and shows all what we call the signs of fear and the pain and all of that, that the animal had no sense of its meaning, that there was no meaning to it. It was just responding in a simple basic awareness. And that, that those of us who watch it by our human consciousness and our empathic identification, think of the animal as suffering, but it's quite point, possible they weren't suffering. Just like that man wasn't suffering when those lions were attacking him. you. Were, or when, when Helen Keller was speaking about being angry she, she couldn't even remember what she was angry at. At the time, you know, she, she was responding with these bodily emotions and so forth, but she didn't know the meaning of what she was, that had no meaning for her. So that would take a lot of the edge off the notion of nature being red and blood and, and, and tooth and claw, because they weren't suffering the way we empathically suffer, in fact, more watching these attacks than they may themselves suffer. Anyway, I'm not sure of that, but I propose it. Now what? Another one. Okay, this person says, is it possible babies are conscious of more than we understand? It is possible. I'm just proposing the newborn is mostly dealing with awareness. For example, the idea of we, that is you and I between mother and child. 
an awareness of relationality. That might become, but I would have to ask whether the relationship between a child and its mother in the very earliest stages is any different from than the relationship between an animal mother and its offspring. They might be really quite similar. We do know that the baby will focus on the mother's voice and the mother's face. And they certainly like being held. Contact comfort. They like being in touch with mom. So can there be spiritual experiences that babies have that are unknown to us as babies cannot describe them? Well, that we couldn't know. Babies can't describe them and of course they're unknown to us. We know that St. John the Baptist slept in the womb of, as Mary approached. That's true, but he, that could have been caused by, by God, naturally enough. If God can create a baby, he could create that kind of intimate connection. So I don't know whether that's God's re reaction or something natural to babies. I've not heard of it of other babies. <clears throat> Given that the right hand connects to the left hemisphere <clears throat> of the brain, <clears throat> Do you think that if Helen's teacher had switched the hands, the left hand touching the object and the right hand used to communicate, the results would have been different? I think the results would have been different. I think they might not have happened at all, or they would have taken much longer. Although this assumes that Helen was right-handed. That's my answer. That's all, there's no more on here now. And this is another one down here. Oh, there's one. Oh. You talked about there were 40,000 years of perhaps being in Polio one. And I assume that, you're, that we're in a civilization that is in Polio three or capable of Polio three. Um, where do you see the future of consciousness? The future of what? Of human consciousness. Is this a progressive argument? It is. And do I think it's progressed to where it could the most? I guess I would say this. If I'm an optimist, the future of human consciousness is to become more and more intimately linked to, to qualia three. But if I'm a pessimist, I'd say the end times are going to hit before then. <laughs> the relationship of consciousness to the soul, I'll have to postpone to in the next lecture. Uh, it is not clear to me how divine revelation introduces a new form of human consciousness. It seems to me that what you call qualia two experience would also include a natural awareness of God. At this level, there is a natural religion and the human capacity to recognize that some sort of God exists. Judeo-Christian revelation lets human beings come to know who God is, but is this distinct from human consciousness? There is something in human consciousness, which naturally I think does tend to, to posit the existence of God. What does this come from? It comes from the, the small experiences that all of us have, I propose, of qualia three in little bits. The wonder of the universe, awe is one of the experiences. We have awe in front of many things. And that's an implicit awareness sometimes of something greater than anything we could call normal. Um, I think all people understand everywhere, people at least, they, let's take religions that propose spirits 
and all of them have some kind of spirits out there causing trouble usually. Uh, and they're, they're transcendent. So there is a natural tendency, but I think it comes from the experience of transcendence in our own life. And one other thing, it comes from the fact that we know we have transcended animal life. So we know there is something that can go above what was. And so that makes us even rationally recognize that there's gotta be a, there could be a possible transcendence above our own consciousness, rationally independent of experience of that realm in its, in its truncated ways that we have. But even I, I, most primitives have some example, do have an experience of the transcendent in my judgment. And many of them have a transcendent experience that posits a uniform God. That is a, a God of, a high God that is one and also a father God. Those are found in the most primitive cultures, not in the more advanced cultures, in the most primitive cultures. They're all found there. If you wanna read the evidence for that, read uh, the translation published a long time ago by a, a German anthropologist and priest named Schmidt. But all cultures have some notion of divine, not necessarily of one God, but all of them have some notion of the transcendent. Even the Greeks with their pantheon, I mean, you know. So we all have, so that can come from the natural experiences of kinds of transcendence, as well as from recognizing that we are qualitatively different from what we observe and think about the physical world, of course, but also of animals. And so therefore, if we're that much different qualitatively from animals, something could be that different from us. That's the best I can do with that question. And I think I'm a woman. Jesus, how could I explain Jesus's consciousness? I don't think I could. I mean, except that he's a human and you know, that we could say, yes. Oh, another question, two more. Is it believed that perhaps there is some kind of paradisocial learning with spiritual practices such as adoration of the Blessed Sacrament that could play a role in individuals moving from Q2 to Q3 through a kind of transcendence akin to the move from Q1 to Q2? Very interesting possibility. I don't know but it would be a very important thing to discover because it, it may be already there in the, in the lives of the mystics as to how to move more rapidly from Q2 to Q3. That's somewhat analogous uh, of the way in which we've moved from Q1 to Q2. Fascinating question. I don't know what the answer is. There might be something like that. Regarding the advanced dementia Alzheimer patient, does his human consciousness revert back to qualia one? What about one with severe mental illness? Severe mental illness might move back to qualia one when you're uh, in, in, in having an episode of severity. And it's, you know, most people who have severe mental illness are, are not having it all the time. They can have a schizophrenic episode. I don't know. It might be they go back to qualia one. This also could be true to, with Alzheimer's when you finally get past the place where the person can no longer even speak. There's no evidence that they know what you're saying when you speak to them. They may have regressed to qualia one. Of course, they're still human because they were born a human and still are a human, just like a baby is a human before they reach qualia two. 
So that's no argument for either abortion or for euthanasia. But it's quite possible that those two suggestions are correct. <clears throat> No more questions. Good evening, everybody. Born. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Viz. What a wonderful evening you've made for us. There will um you will be speaking on the soul in two months' time in February. We're looking forward to getting to the heart of your soul and understanding more about the soul. But in the meantime, there'll be another um, Newman lecture on the 19th of January by Eric Johnson, and he'll speak to um, different ways of understanding the whole person. Um, and he's, he calls his approach form psychology, and he's very close uh, to what we're working on here. And so we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Eric Johnson join us um, in January. Once again, thank you, Paul. Wonderful evening. Adios. <laughs> Adios. Vaya con Dios. <laughs>